Our lecture today is going to bring us to the ancient Near East. And we're going to look specifically at an area of the world called the Fertile Crescent. It begins along the Mediterranean, arching up through Israel, Lebanon, and Syria, before descending down into Iraq and the Persian Gulf. Specifically, we're going to be looking at the area between the Tigris, this river here, and the Euphrates River, down here. And this is going to be Mesopotamia. Fun fact about this name is it's actually Greek. Mesopotamia means the land between two rivers. So let's take a look and see what type of people are living here. This is still the Neolithic Age. This is between 8000 and 2000 BC. The Ice Age has ended. The Earth has become more habitable. Humans are more agrarian. They're farming crops, domesticating animals. The shelters become more permanent. We're going to see some mud brick shelters here shortly. Life expectancy, well under 40. And humans are beginning to live in communities. All sorts of wonderful things are being invented right now. The wheel, plow, irrigation techniques, writing, beer, development of schools, libraries, and written laws. The bad part about this time period, and specifically this location, you've heard there's never going to be peace in the Middle East. Well, guess what? There never was. The Sumerians came first around 3500 BC. Then the Akkadians, the Neo-Sumerians, the Babylonians, the Syrians, the Neo-Babylonians, and then the Persians. There is a lot of warfare in this area of the world. So let's take a look at some artifacts from several of these cultures. The first one is going to be the Sumerians. And here we have cuneiform writing. This is the first known use of written text. The script evolved from a pictograph system of communication. You would read it from top to bottom, but right to left. Let's take a look at the walls and tower of Jericho. Jericho was among the earliest cities in this area, a collection of houses made from mud brick. And the town itself was between six and ten acres in size, with a population of two to three thousand people. You have to imagine, for this time in the world, this city would have been huge. Defensively, it had the earliest stone fortification. The mud brick walls were 20 feet high and five feet thick. There was also a tower, 28 feet high, with a 33 foot diameter an internal staircase, and that would have been an incredible architectural achievement. They even built a large water tank for irrigation purposes. And it's really amazing that we have some of the city remaining roughly 10,000 years after it was built. Why was it built with mud brick? Well, keep in mind that in this area of the world, stone and wood are really scarce. So it's made out of mud brick, but unfortunately it is not as durable. Very little of it is left, and much of that in some pretty major decay. So what I'd like to do now is move away from Jericho, which is kind of in the western part of our map near the Mediterranean, move east to the cities of Uruk and Ur. And you'll notice that, look at all the cities plotted around these rivers. And the reason that is, is we need to live during this time period near a water source. So Uruk and Ur are where some famous ziggurats are created. Now a ziggurat is basically a pyramidal structure. Instead of coming to a point, the pyramid is flattened off, almost as if it's like a plateau. On this, this plateau, there would be a temple. Normally, ziggurats are like 40 to 50 feet high, and this would also bring the temple closer to the heavens, but it would also lift the temple up off of any floodplain. 
just by saying that this is a temple, it kind of leads us to into the talk of religion in this area of the world. This is a polytheistic culture, and we're also going to see that next week when we talk about the Egyptian civilization. The gods were very exacting. They wanted faithful attendance in these shrines. And in a few images, we'll look at some of the votive sculptures that the wealthy would commission to basically place in the temples facing other sculptures of the gods. They would serve basically as a proxy. We do not have any clear-cut definition of what they thought the afterlife would be. Now, this white temple in the city of Uruk, it's one of the earliest constructed. It is definitely not the best conserved, but imagine, if you will, how this would have looked when it was brand new, when it had whitewashed walls and how it would reflect the desert sun. It would have been absolutely stunning. Now, the best conserved ziggurat is nearby in the city of Ur. This is one of the larger ziggurats. It is 50 feet in height. The base is a solid mass of mud brick. And then there's three ramps or stairs that meet at a central gateway. Each of those has 100 steps. And then there's another ramp that would have led to the original temple. And so here's what a reconstruction of it would have looked like. It was even said that the Tower of Babel was a ziggurat. And here's our troops during the Gulf War. Another fun fact about these structures is that just like pyramids, they are oriented with the compass points. This is a reconstruction of the city of Ur. You can see how close to the center of the city the ziggurat is placed. So religion, commerce, administration, they are all centered at the nucleus of this city. And I had mentioned the votive figures earlier. This is an example of those votive figures. They're made out of limestone. And then when you look at their faces, note how geometric they are. The bodies are very cylindrical. The eyes particularly are enhanced. The Sumerians believe that their eyes were the windows to the soul. The largest figure here is Abu, and he is the god of vegetation. The smaller individuals, those are the mortals I was talking about. Those that were fairly wealthy, they could commission these sculptures, and some of them had names on them, others had different prayers that they were giving to this main god of vegetation. And now we're going to talk about the Warka vase. This was also found in the city of Uruk. It's made from alabaster, it's 36 inches high, and during the art theft lecture, I had mentioned that this was one of the objects stolen from the Baghdad Museum. It was returned, but it had been broken into about 13 different pieces. It's a remarkable work of art because this is the first time that we have a true narrative in terms of art. And narrative, of course, is really the basis of art history. This is what we look for. We try to put the puzzle pieces together for these civilizations. All we had before this were the cave paintings, which were kind of like a haphazard collection of images on the wall. They really didn't tell us a story. The vessel's narrative is divided into bands or what we more professionally call registers. The lowest register shows the natural world, mostly plants and water. Next, we have alternating bands of male and female sheep. In the next band, the men are carrying baskets of Earth's bountiful harvests. And the top register shows the goddess Inanna, who is the goddess of love and war, as she accepts an offering from the priest king. So this vase depicts a ritual or religious festival in her honor. And now we're going to move to the city of Ein Gazal, which is just east of Jericho over the Jordan River. 
At Ein Gazal, it's about a thousand years later in terms of moving more toward our time period than Jericho was. But it's also three times as large, covering over 30 acres in size. It was populated for over 2,000 years. And one of the most intriguing things found on this site were these basically three foot tall figures. There are 36 of the figures that have been unearthed because they were ritually buried. Now these figures in your book, the book will only tell you that 30 of them were found, but six have been found since its publication. They mark a complete advancement from prehistoric sculpture. And the difference is that these figures were modeled instead of carved. When we look at the way sculpture is created, it's either made with the additive method or the subtractive method. The subtractive method is carving. It's where you take a material and you chip and you gouge and you hammer away at it until you get to the desired form. Here though, these figures were modeled. Material was added to them rather than subtracted from them. And that's the way that these were created. They're made from wet plaster that's been applied to a framework of reeds and twine. The eyes are shells and the pupils are made out of bitumen, which is an asphalt compound. The figures originally had hair, basically wigs and clothing. So they're almost like a stand-in for people. And just the size is kind of freaky when you think about it. So here we have like the Paleolithic sculpture at the left Again, carving, subtractive method, and one of the other figures from Ein Gazal. And you can definitely see how the shells make terrific eyes. And this is Neolithic sculpture where we're adding material. I think one of my favorite things when I worked at a museum was to see our collection of cylinder seals. To me, they were just incredibly cool. They're only about an inch, maybe a uh, an inch and a half in terms of height and half an inch in terms of diameter. They're made out of marble. They're usually rolled across some type of wet clay and there's a narrative involved in each of these. The seals were used to mark container lids, sign and secure documents and signify property ownership. So it was in a way almost like a coat of arms would be, or a signet ring that gets pressed into wax. And unfortunately there, I do have a video, but I can't play it because of copyright restrictions. But what I'll do is I will put it in the link to in the description of the video, or I'll put it up on our Canvas site so you can take a look at it. And now we have what I think is one of the more beautiful artifacts from this age. This is the Great Lyre, or Bullheaded Harp. It was found in the royal tomb at Ur, and it had totally collapsed. It laid flat on the ground, and it has been reconstructed or reassembled to how you see it here. The bull's head is made from gold along with other semi-precious stones, and you can kind of see underneath that false beard on the bull, that there's, again, kind of that narrative like we saw with the Uruk vase. And I'm gonna bring up a close-up of that, a detail work, and we'll talk about it. The very bottom panel is, and it's, it is kind of creepy because these animals are personifying humans. In this bottom register, we've got the scorpion man holding something in his hands, we're not quite sure. And behind him is a gazelle holding two cups. Now, scorpion men were associated with the land of demons. In the next register up, we have a number of animal musicians. One of them, a donkey assisting a bear, plays a harp just like what we're looking at. In the next register, we have a lion and a hyena imitating human posture again bringing food and drink to a feast. The hyena has a knife in his belt, so he kind of like almost plays the role of a butcher. And again, we've got various parts of other animals kind of on a tray. At the very top, 
We've got a bearded man in the center, and his arms are around two human-headed bulls, which are a common creature found in Near Eastern art. And this could be the deceased of whose tomb the liar was found in. Now, there are some theories about the top and bottom registers, particularly being stories from the Epic of Gilgamesh. But the problem was, that wasn't written for another 700 years yet. Moving into the Akkadian Empire, we've got this really cool work of the head of an Akkadian ruler. And this is, you know, all that survives from a statue that was probably toppled sometime during antiquity, most likely during the sack of Nineveh in 612 AD. It is surprising that we have it because normally a sculpture like this that's been made in bronze sometime during its age would have been melted down to create other types of objects. It was made with the lost wax casting method, which means that the sculpture itself was hollow. We do see deliberate mutilation of the figure, and particularly his ears and eyes have been gouged out, possibly to destroy any power that this sculpture may have had or particularly for the eyes, it could have been encrusted with jewels. We're not sure if this was a specific person, but most likely it was a generalized or idealized male. The curled beard and elaborately braided hair circling the head and ending in a knot at the back of the head indicates a figure of royalty, possibly some type of monarch. Now, the lost wax casting method is an invention of the Bronze Age, which is where we are right now in history. The whole idea of casting, which is pouring liquid metal into molds, originated in Nigeria. Now, the lost wax casting method, once again, it's about creating a hollow sculpture. There's various steps within this process, but the whole idea is that there's less material that's used, which means that, especially with bronze, that we have less money that we're gonna to need to purchase this material. And of course, the sculpture is lighter in weight. I always kind of give an analogy of the lost wax casting method is very similar to those chocolate Easter bunnies we get at Easter. Can you imagine if those Easter bunnies were solid chocolate, how expensive they would be, how heavy that they would be, how much chocolate that would be? It's the same thing, the idea of being able to create that hollow makes it cost effective, less material is used, and it's lighter in weight. The method itself is about nine different steps. This one shows you about six or seven of them. And here is some live lost wax casting from Nigeria in this picture. We'll talk about a couple of steelies, or sometimes they are pronounced steels. This first one is the stele of Naram Sin. And a stele, I should tell you first off, is basically a gigantic rock. It's a sculpture and it stands, this one here, about six and a half feet in height. Naram Sin is an Akkadian king who defeats the people of the Zagros Mountains, which are in Southern Iran. This artwork illustrates the very first military victory that we see. And we've got Naram Sin kind of up near the stars. And these are personifications of the gods who are watching over the king. And you can see that there's a spear in one of the enemy's neck and the other one begs for mercy while his troops are rising up behind him. The term hierarchical scale can be used here. Sometimes it's called emphasis by scale or heretic scale. The idea that this king, Naram Sin, is two to three times larger than the other figures. And of course, if you watch shows like Ancient Aliens, they're gonna tell you, oh, it was a race of giants. No, this is just letting you know really who the king is. And we're gonna see this in Egyptian art we're also gonna see this in early Renaissance art where you have, for instance, a Madonna and child that are three, four, five times larger than the surrounding angels.
Now let's talk about Gudea of Lagash. Gudea ruled the city-state of Lagash, and it was the only city-state that did not fall at the end of the Akkadian Empire. But when you look at this sculpture, does it really look like that of a ruler? And you have to think, why or why not? How is a ruler supposed to look? And what can you say about Gudea from just looking at this sculpture? Thinking about the adjectives that we can use. Is he strong? Is he weak? Peaceful? Pious? All sorts of terms we could use to describe what these figures look like. The sculpture at the right is only 29 inches in height, which is going to be rather small for a ruler. When we get to the Egyptian civilization, you're looking at sculptures that might be six feet sitting down. The sculpture may be small because of the material it's carved out of, which is diorite. And it is a really difficult stone to carve. In fact, the only thing that's really stronger than diorite is diamond. Not only that, but the stone itself is kind of unique because it had to have been imported. It's indigenous to areas more of Egypt, Germany, Italy, even Romania, but not really the Middle East. It has a beautiful glossy finish, and this sculpture is really never going to decay or break. This work will really last forever. And you're looking at something right now that's close to 4,500, 5,000 years old. This is not the only sculptures of Gudea. There were many of them produced and they were located all over the city. The eyes, once again, kind of like the Sumerian culture, are wide open. So they are reminiscent of those votive sculptures. We also have cuneiform, which is that writing on the surface of the robe that you see. And it's the first time we have writing on an artwork. It translates into a dedication of the sculpture and the temple it was in to the divine goddess of poetry and the interpreter of dreams. In the work at the right, he holds a vessel from which life-giving water flows, and you'll see on either side of the two streams, you'll also have some fish located there as well. Moving on to the Babylonian Empire, we have one of the most iconic figures of Near Eastern art, which is the Stele of Hammurabi. It's fairly large, about seven feet in height, and it's a record of the decisions and decrees made by Hammurabi during his 42-year reign as the king of Babylon. Hammurabi codified Mesopotamian law. This really was his major contribution to civilization. The inscription, just like the Gedea of Lagash, is in cuneiform. When we look up at the very top of the sculpture, we've got Hammurabi receiving the blessing of Shamash, which is the sun god and god of justice. The king here acts as an intermediary between both God and his people. You'll also notice that the god is wearing a four-tiered headdress, very similar to the three-tiered papal crown. You have rays emanating from his shoulders indicating more specifically that he is the sun god. In his right hand, he holds a measuring rod and a rope ring, symbols of justice and power. The code that Hammurabi establishes is going to be the rule of Mesopotamia for the next thousand years. Over 300 of the entries have been decoded, and most of them are going to deal with property issues. But 68, domestic problems, another 20 physical assaults. Punishment depended upon gender and social standing. Where you hear that term, an eye for an eye, that comes from the stele of Hammurabi. Over in the Assyrian Empire, we have this relief sculpture, Ashurbanipal II, Killing Lions. And it's really carnage for the sake of royal sport. Babylon falls to invasion in 1585 BC, and from their ruins, the Assyrian Empire emerges around 1100 BC. 883 BC, that's when Ashurbanipal II rises to power, and he creates a magnificent city. It's surrounded by five miles of mud brick walls. They're 120 feet thick, 
42 feet high and many of the walls were decorated with reliefs and that's where we get this work from. And even though this work looks and it makes the king look very manly, he's riding on a chariot, he's killing lions, in reality this is a very closed in almost like how the Colosseum would have been in Rome. You have a small closed in area, you've got a person who is driving the king around, the king is going to shoot one lion at a time that's let out into this area, and you've got the people behind the lion who are there who are also going to protect the king if the lion does get too close. So it is a little bit of political propaganda here. Ashurbanipal uh, and his queen in the garden. It's unusual because this is a very peaceful or serene scene. And I'm sorry, it's kind of pixelated in this image, but we're seeing a ruler here at rest or on his weekend, on his day off. The king reclines on this couch and the queen sits in a chair just opposite him. Servants are arriving with trays of food. Others are uh, whisking away insects with uh, hand brooms. His necklace hangs from one of the arms of the couch. When we look off to the very far left though, and this is right up over here, we've got the head of an enemy that hangs from a tree. Unfortunately, his empire is going to collapse around 600 BC and fall under Persian rule. A few of the amazingly large sculptures that we have from this time period are called Lamassus. And you can imagine walking through an Assyrian palace 3,000 years ago and you come across these figures. They're over 14 feet high. I mean, how do you feel about the king and the army? It's like they're incredibly powerful. It's a society that might, be, might even be fearful of some type of attack and these sculptures kind of serve as symbolic defensive measures. Once again, we see politics, propaganda, and art all mixing together. The Lamassu was there to impress and to intimidate. It was the bearded head of a man, the body of a lion or bull, the wings of an eagle, and the horned headdress of a god. Unfortunately, these, many of these have been destroyed, and particularly the ones that are, were in its original locations. Most of them do reside in museums where they're safe, but this is from the city of Nineveh. It doesn't stand there any longer. In fact, there's one other city where these stood, and we're not even sure uh, about their safety anymore. The last topic I want to talk about is the city of Persepolis. And this is the capital of the ancient Persian Empire. It's a sprawling ceremonial and administrative complex, palatial dwellings, government buildings, grand staircases, and columned halls. This is our most important source of knowledge about Persian art and architecture. It's situated on a high plateau, it's heavily fortified, and Alexander the Great and his armies were the ones who leveled this site in a gesture of destroying the Persian imperial power around 330 BC. But even in ruins, this is a really impressive place. And there was a lot of relief sculpture here. The Royal Audience Hall, which you see right in this area here, was absolutely gigantic, 60 foot high, 217 feet in length in each direction, with 36 columns holding up the ceiling. It would have held an audience of thousands. These stairs leading up were made in such a way that if you were riding a horse, you could easily mount these stairs. We've also got some relief carvings on the front of them, and I'll show you those in just a second. See a reconstruction of Persepolis here. A better image of the stairway. more reconstruction. And so with the relief carvings on the staircase, 
They are notably different than earlier relief sculpture, such as the Ashurbanipal II killing lions. These are more deeply carved, and I wouldn't call it high relief. That's going to be something we'll see toward the end of the Greek and early Roman era. A royal procession of guards, noblemen, dignitaries, as well as representatives of 23 nations. You can kind of see them going on right off here to the left. each of them bringing tributes to the king. Each person is dressed in their national costume. These were also originally painted, and we'll see that with a lot of sculpture from this time. Usually just the main material of the building still lasts, but under microscopes, we can see that there were originally ochres or pieces of wax would have been in caustic paint that these would have been painted with. And this is where we're going to end our presentation today on ancient Near Eastern art. Our next presentation is going to be on Egypt.